Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So this session is part of the semantic computing uh, theme that we have uh, the, throughout the Paris uh, summit. This is uh, a theme where we are acknowledging that data is a first class citizen and uh, we just want to see what are the technologies that uh, we need to, to work on so that we can actually go beyond data on the path from data information knowledge and intelligence. This morning we have three sessions. And actually this morning I'll be chairing the session and also chairing myself. So uh, I will be giving the first talk and then we have two presentations. One uh, from Hayam Hirsch who will be joining us in a second and the other one from uh, Serge Charor, uh, the, the last one of this session. So first of all, um, I'll be talking, uh, I'll introduce myself quickly. I'll be talking about breaking down data barriers. I am at Microsoft Research. I'll talk about first about uh, my background in terms of being in academia and uh, right now over 10 years on, uh, in Microsoft. And then I'm going to focus this morning on how we can use data to drive innovation. Uh, talking about some programs I've been running where we've been providing assets to the research community and what we've been learning from the research community when we've gone from providing data releases and now on the path to providing data services. And uh, while we're doing that, because we're looking for innovations and what are the type of new internet uh, experiences and intelligent experiences that can come from working with the data. One of the challenges I'll be talking about is how we can actually make uh, this data large scale, real world data available to the research community in a way where people will be able, researchers will be able to uh, do some innovations do some experimentations and at the same time we want to make sure that we're going to maintain the privacy of the data and by privacy I'll come back to it there is privacy of the users but there is also privacy in terms of business sensitivities and some legal uh, sensitivity too so when you think uh, copyrights. So a little bit about me uh, prior to Microsoft I was in academia for those who are still wondering where my accent comes from despite my affiliation and my beautiful American accent. So actually I'm French from France, south of France. So it's great to be here in Paris, uh, although it's really the north for me. Uh, so I worked, I did my PhD actually, my doctorate in natural language generation. And uh, so my background is computational linguistics, natural language processing, and I also work on intelligent planning. Since I've been at Microsoft, uh, so I've been uh, in uh, business units, which was really interesting actually like how to develop some, uh, some technologies which actually can impact like millions and millions of users. Uh, and I worked on semantic search and uh, about eight years ago before it was trendy in the company about some natural user interactions. More recently uh, at Microsoft Research, well, I've been at Microsoft Research over five, six years now, but more recently I'm driving this initiative on semantic computing, which is what these sessions are about. So let's talk about going beyond data. And uh, as I was mentioning, the vision is really how can we enable next generation internet and working with a bunch of different stakeholders, talking people like you in academia. This is where most of the brain power is. And, uh, and as you know, there has been uh, plenty of talks as during the keynotes or the plenaries talking about how we need to engage with academia, right? So people like you, stakeholders, other stakeholders from industry to from government industries and Hayam had spent some time there and uh, he, I'm sure he'll talk a little, maybe a little bit about it or if not I will introduce you and mention it definitely. And last but not least also the consumers and innovators. More and more the web has become not just like this place where we consume information but also where people produce information, right? Like data information. And so how can also we bring this community to help with the next generation of innovation? So as I mentioned uh, during those sessions, data has become a first class citizen. And for people who are still not convinced it's a data driven world, just a little, uh, some examples 
where uh, some technologies were really, uh, by using a lot, lot of data, we've seen like tremendous differences uh, in the way of when, how, how this can scale, right? Like spell checking. Machine translation is actually by uh, my background. I did work when I was in the research lab I, uh, before Microsoft in the machine translation system. I'm talking pre-web uh, and uh, ontology based and, uh, and this thing didn't scale. And, and again, that's pre-web. And now machine translation is about, you know, give me some text in French, another text in uh, Spanish. And uh, the more I have, the better. Here are some quotes. Uh, Banco and Brill, some people from uh, Microsoft Research who were talking about uh, really the, the importance of the data size. More recently, uh, Peter Norvig about also mentioning how the size of the data is, so, is important. So, as I mentioned earlier, some of the big challenges we face when, as an industry, we want to provide access to data are privacy, business sensitivity, and, uh, and also scale, right? When you think of uh, the web, for instance, or the Bing index, or we're talking about like having scale. We're talking about having machines so that you, so that you can process, process sorry, the data at a scale which is not uh, necessarily or usually available in all universities. So again, how can we make sure that um, the research community can still drive innovation when we're talking about this large scale data driven research? So I'll be talking about uh, this morning about some data academic engagements and how we went from data releases, adding some data compute and finally today data services. Just a reminder, why do we want to provide access to data? Well, there are at least three good reasons. Innovation, right, I already mentioned that. We hope that there will be new analysis, new research directions, which will be enabled in the research community by having access to that. Science, very important, right? Being able to repeat experiments. There are some areas, and I will mention, for instance, the area in uh, web search, which is one I've been working on, where it's difficult even for some of our researchers to publish some papers because the data they are working on cannot be made available to the research community. So then, you know, how do you know that this research is more valid than this other one? And of course, it's not just in web search, if you think medical data, so any data which has some uh, sensitivity. So how can we help with that? And also, last but not least, training. And we've heard about that actually uh, yesterday uh, uh, from Yahoo, a Yahoo talk from Ricardo, was talking about, you know, when people come to our company and they have to work on this large scale system, they are not necessarily trained for that. So how can we help with that too? And then every con has two sides, right? So that's the promises and then the challenges. I was mentioning that we go from, we've been going from users being data consumers to users being data producers. And this also comes with this other side where, where there are people who are out there like trying to figure out what's going on and, uh, and there are some people who, are, who have become like data snoopers, right? When you look at all that we put on the, on the internet, this place where you know, things stay forever there, so there is a lot of information about ourselves. I was mentioning that uh, it was difficult to provide search queries to the research community and here, a company that uh, tried to do so, like just putting it without restrictions, some, uh, some anonymization on the data. And then there was this um, big um, uh, issue where uh, the wall, uh, I believe, yeah, the New York Times was able to, some people in the New York, New York Times were able to go and identify one person, right? And so this, uh, this person uh, there. So we have to be extremely careful when we talk about providing access to data to the research community. Having said that, so we have provided in Microsoft Research prior to the example I was just giving before, we did provide in 2006, working with, uh, at the time, so the, the, the Bing division, we did provide access to uh, some uh, search queries, and I think some of you here had access to it. Uh, that was a request for proposal that we did. Uh, we did anonymize the data so that there was no user information. So that comes with trade-offs, right? 
And here are some of uh, what, what we did. PII, this is personal and identifiable information that we uh, removed. And after a year into the project, so we had, uh, I believe, uh, 10 awardees for this uh, request for proposal. And, 10, uh, and when they came a year later, there was a project review by the research which had been done. And I just the question about you know, what was uh, good, bad, and wanted in the data that, uh, that you received. So the good, of course, was, was you know, thank you. We had access to something we didn't have access before. That's great. The bad was, well, you know, it's, uh, we don't have a lot of transparency in the way you put the data, or you slice it in a way that doesn't really fit my research. Or another was like, you know, actually, I really want to follow a user, and this one is a no-no. Um, and the list of the wanted was enormous. So the ask, I kind of summarized the big asks, was, you know, we need more data. Come on, you're Microsoft here, yeah, right? You, you have more data. Can't you provide more data? You're talking about scale here. And uh, I just mentioned the follow the user, but that's for privacy reason. We cannot obviously do it. And we did run another program uh, a year later, and uh, we just go to the new ask, which were interesting to me. So actually for that program, we provided more data. So we went from 15 million uh, logs to uh, 100 million. That's, you know, we're not talking petabytes, or, but you know, th that was more. And, uh, and actually what came back, some people were like, actually, you know, that's too much data. So we uh, really, uh, you know, we don't need access to the raw data necessarily. We need really to have access to the data or to s the data which has been processed in some form. And another one was like, well, you know, we don't have enough compute power, so can you help with that? And that's where we started thinking about what can we do still to help with uh, providing access to data, but in a way where, one, we're going to keep the privacy our top priority, and uh, at the same time, we can address some of these issues that we've heard from, right? You size the data in a way which is now doesn't fit me, or I don't have the compute power, and that. And we have developed so one service, uh, which is the Web and Gram service. This is just one example, and we are still learning from it. Where uh, what we did is we took the Bing index, so the index from the, our from the Microsoft search engine, and uh, instead of providing just like, well, first we cannot provide the Bing index. Uh, it, uh, it has uh, some business values. We are always, we're doing research, but we are also, uh, um, we work in uh, collaboration with, uh, actually in this case, Bing. Uh, but Bing is uh, our um, search engine, so we just cannot provide the index out there. But what can we do still with this very rich resource? And so that's where we provide, instead of actually even providing an engram, we provide the service. So uh, for those who are not too familiar with engrams, this is a technology which is useful in some of the applications I've listed there, search, machine translation, speech, etc. I won't go into much of the details. By the way, there is a, demos, uh, a demo uh, on those web engrams later. So because we started late and so that we don't uh, finish later, I'm just going to skip on some of the facts where we found. And there are some papers where dab, 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 which gives a little bit of uh, uh, what we've done there, uh, just uh, to mention that the web, the web data has structure and some of the things we uh, found out is that, well indeed if you look at the first row down there which is the language model for the user queries, what you want when you look for the documents, you want something which is really close to that. And actually if you look at it, instead of looking for the body, it's really the row of the anchor of the title which are closer to the query, whereas most of the search engine re user, uh, rely on unigrams and, and the body. So, you know, maybe it's not exactly the right thing to do. Some of the differences from uh, different uh, engrams which have been released uh, in the community, I just put some examples here, but to highlight uh, first in terms of content types, we are providing uh, access to not just the body of the document, but also title and anchor text. The anchor text is this href that you have in HTML documents where you can provide, also can provide extra uh, information there, titles in, in their way. Uh, we have been using all the documents and not just doing any uh, cutoff. Uh, I should specify it's from the uh, English, the, e the English uh, US market. Another difference is that uh, we are providing this via hosted uh, services. And then we have several snapshots not just one. 
So to try to make it a little bit concrete and how you can use this service, here are some examples. Uh, what we did here is like using the Twitter API. And, uh, and so they have, I believe it's the weekly most um, uh, frequent tags. Uh, this one is a bit old, this, this one, we have some live ones uh, uh, outside for this demo. But here are some examples. So if you uh, take the first tag, the, so the tags, the hashtags, they are all, you know, the words are, not the words, oh yes, actually the words are all concatenated there. And how, can we do like a very crude word breaking as it were? And so here are some examples. Yeah, I said it, where we provide the top five uh, probability, the log probability here. Another one. When I first met, and here, yes, we get uh, nice results. Now playing, here are more examples. Uh, still another one. My favorite is probably this one, which is like it would be very difficult with an NLP, NLP system to figure out what that was, right? Uh, right, and when you look at the first one, it's wait for you. And this is just, you know, using the sheer power of data. And so when you read it, you know, an NLP system would be very difficult. And, uh, and actually at Microsoft, we, are, uh, we have a very diverse um, a set of people with the different nationality languages. And of course, we all tried our own language to try what this thing would give us. So here I selected French, obviously. And so parlez-vous français, do you speak French? And uh, it also seems to work, which was a surprise. And we have, uh, so we have people in the team, so we tried German, we tried um, um, Spanish, we tried uh, Italian, we tried some other languages. This is anecdotal, we haven't done any evaluation, but we're surprised by those, by those results. Here, another application, uh, somebody from the Rensselaer, a researcher from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, Dr. Ding, who did use the Web and Gram service to uh, produce some multi-tag cloud. And so what he did is like he applied to a data set from data.gov uh, and trying to figure out what these uh, titles were talking about. So if you look at, if you just use like single tag cloud, you can see it's talking about data, it's an inventory, release, state. Okay, that's okay, it's talking about that. But now when you start combining and using some of the engrams, you can, with the multi-tag multi -tag cloud, you can say that, you can see that it's actually talking about critical habitat, right? So it provides more context. So the innovation here is not so much about, you know, it's not the idea of coming up with multi tag cloud, but it's really like how fast it was. It's really about agile experimentation. That was really interesting here. Here, another example of uh, an application of the WebNGram where we did use uh, the, the API to do some very crude query segmentation, right? So here's an example of Mike Seawick Lawyer. Michigan, which is an example cited to show like, you know, how difficult it is to recognize entities. And here it's just saying, okay, you know, it looks like uh, Mike Seawick may be a grouping, uh, actually in both whether you look at the body, the title and anchor. And here we did some experiments a little bit just to try to figure out um, if we were uh, getting like different results with those different structures. So a little bit of what uh, summary of what we found out so far. Uh, is that a cross-lingual document seems to be you know, out there. I mean, it just seems to be a way of life um, and uh, at a first approximation. And, um, and it did seem to work on other languages, which we were very surprised. Again, no, there is no evaluation on that, but very anecdotally, we're not expecting it to work so well. Um, and documents have structure and styles, and some of the things like we're wondering when we start talking about the language identif identification, do we actually really need to focus about you know, French, English, Spanish, or also really start talking, looking more into the structures of the document? And that's in itself also one way of identifying languages. All right, so just for people interested, that's uh, information there on the WebNGram, uh, questions to uh, the WebNGram. This is free for non-commercial research, anyone can have access to it. Uh, we have uh, two uh, snapshots, and uh, we have two actually on Azure, I think I'm talking, yes, actually, there was a program with the computing, uh, we worked with uh, Hayam on that, on the uh, computing in the cloud where the awardees have access to the uh, engrams on Azure, so at this point it's not just access to, to the data, but it's also data compute if needed. Uh, some research papers, CIGAR and uh, Serge actually, uh, who will be speaking later, uh, was also at that uh, workshop, and I am too. 
Uh, so some research like being done, not just with the Web and Gram uh, service, but you know, like just using uh, Web and Grams. Here, after all, you know, we're talking like semantic computing, so I wanted just to inject a little bit of like going beyond a large scale data and what, how do we get there a little bit more to another type of semantics? And uh, so it's a very simple example here where uh, on the uh, top, uh, the right hand side up there, there, there is this uh, phrase, Chateau Montelena in Napa. And just using the Web and Grant service, we can see that uh, we have this grouping of Chateau Montelena and then we have Napa. And so when if you had something like that, and then now, and, and that's very easy to uh, produce this type of results and using, you know, the, like billions and billions of uh, documents to support those, uh, those results. So then if you start using other type of data, like structured data, in this case, uh, Wikipedia and the info boxes, well, maybe you can start uh, bringing in a bit more uh, information to, to, to the user. So for instance, in that case, let's say I am on, my, on, I am on the go in Napa Valley, I'm looking at a blog uh, on wine, and then maybe you know, on the right-hand side, I can start bringing it, yeah, here's the picture of uh, actually Chanto Montelena. And by the way, did you know there was a great movie? Well, it doesn't say that, but I mean, there was a movie, but all shock done you know, about Chanto Montelena. And so you could start bringing in some information like that. All right, so, okay, so uh, I'll finish uh, pretty soon here. I just want to mention uh, a challenge that uh, we have launched uh, in December, a spell challenge, which is a big Microsoft Research Partnership uh, where uh, people are invited, so anyone actually is invited, not just the research community in, in academia, but also in industry, uh, is invited to develop uh, a speller uh, for web search. Uh, here's the link. Here's the, the page, some dates. We launched uh, this in December 15, and we are ending it May 27. If you know, if you have some students interested, if you are interested, I encourage you to, uh, to submit the spell. You can actually use the Web and Gram service uh, to, to create data set. There are prizes too, so just go to the, to the, to the site there. Uh, what we're doing there in terms of uh, on, on the data part, we did provide, we are providing a data set actually. We used uh, uh, track data, the one million query user, user query, sorry, a data set. And we kind of uh, reverse engineered to produce like um, uh, misspelling. And all that is explained so on the site, you can go there, you can download this data uh, freely. And, uh, and some of the things we're learning uh, we also put to encourage the community to uh, also provide their data set, you know, so that other people who wanted to develop their speller could also benefit from those data sets. And, and so far that part, I can tell you, is absolutely not successful. The uh, community data set, uh, I, I won't go through this size, but these are, this is not data anyone can use, right? And, uh, and, and that's some learning. It's like, you know, we're trying to help the, the community and, and that is not flying at all, actually, that people are just not interested in sharing um, their data, maybe just this context, but these are things that we are, we are just learning. So to summarize, and, uh, and I have some questions for you, like now and, uh, you know, and uh, during uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, so my question to you is like, how can we better uh, engage with academia when we're talking about uh, driving uh, data-driven research? Uh, also the question about uh, how can a data service help, right? How does it change the research people do? Today people uh, are very used to, um, to having access to, to the data, kind of as data release. So when we start talking about, now you don't have access, you don't actually see the data, but you have a service on the data, how does it change your research or not? And, uh, and then the other question, a bit more uh, broader question, how can you know, Microsoft industry, information industries, what can we do to help democratize uh, large scale data driven research with again the idea that if you need data compute and there are some programs I know NSF has been driving. Um, so what can we do there to help and to make sure that the research community, the academic research community, continue to drive innovations in that field, can train the um, their researcher and the students who are the next generation, actually, researchers. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, so um, uh, my answer to those two questions uh, would be that um, Microsoft should really join the linked data community. Mm -hmm. So the linked data community is basically a set of W3C standards for sharing data at scale. So I would beg mm -hmm. <laughs> Microsoft to please um, follow the standards to make the data available under Sparkle. Even if you don't make all of the data, to make the queries come back as um, RDF. Right. So, so there are some efforts and, and, and some parts of the company who are definitely looking into linked data. Uh, having said that, so making everything, again, I mean, making everything available, uh, remember that not everything can be open data, right? Open in the sense because of the sensitivity, privacy, and things like that. Whatever can be, there are, there, there are definitely some efforts looking into that, and we are too. So. And, and actually, my... Right, right, yeah, and, exactly. And actually, so we look. Mm -hmm. It'll be really interesting to have the conversation about that question after some of the things I say as well, um, because I try to showcase some of the issues that make it hard to make data available in different ways, and you know, the Ngram server is one way to do that. But um, I think we're all on the same page what we're trying to achieve. But there's all these additional non-technical sensibilities that come into play with company sensitivities and, right. and so mm -hmm. on. And, mm -hmm. um, Oh, there was another question <laughs> in the back, and I'll, I'll maybe. Yeah, I'll, oh, okay. Maybe while you change your computer, it's just a, ch a short oh. question. <laughs> maybe one possibility is of giving a, academics more access would be to have some possibility to deploy new services mm -hmm. in your machine. So it's not only that you get a particular service out there, but maybe with some sort of uh, mechanism or established workflow, I can deploy a new service in order to do some kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. and then get the results which are also like um, polished from personal data or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure how this works out, but I think that if you engage a few researchers, this, something like this could be accomplished, and that would be much more useful than having a single service, which is already very right, nice. Right, 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 absolutely. As I mentioned, so I completely agree with you, right? And as I mentioned, this is just one example. We wanted to start somewhere, right? And because also the way you do research when you have just the data and then now it's via a service also changes things too, right? So we wanted to learn from that. And there are things you can do that you cannot do. <laughs> I mean, sorry, there are things you can do when you have access to the raw data that you cannot do when you have access to the, via a service. And, but, but it's kind of a trade-offs. But uh, yeah, I completely agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll take a last question and then we'll, we'll move. Yeah, I think you, you kind of you kind of somewhat addressed the point. So first, but firstly, as a benefit as a benefity of both the query log and the ngram servers, I do have to thank you for making that available. Um, I was somewhat surprised to see that someone told you the data was too large, but I suspect mm -hmm. that that is because there are while we have tools in, for instance, information retrieval community for indexing documents we haven't had access to the data enough to actually go and create the tools to work with large query logs yet. Mm -hmm. You guys have, I don't know, Dryad or pig-based solutions. You know, what you, you know how to mine them. So I think there's certainly, if we had these query logs, then more often in a larger scale, we would be creating the tools to allow us to alter these. But I, so the, the second point is, but are you, by just providing services, you're in some way hindering the development of, you're, you're, you're hindering the development because people aren't able to go and. You are what, sorry, say You're again. hindering. So, you're, okay. so mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. um, maybe I want to tokenize the URLs on the Clue Web Collection. So I think your WWW paper shows how to use the, the Ngram service to tokenize URLs, but I can't apply that to 50 million URLs because it's not, it, it's, it's not feasible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, so I don't know about hindering. As I mentioned, you know, these are trade-offs, right? I think that, so one of the things, for instance, I think that services, uh, and again, we learn it, right? So that's why, I mean, the, the feedback is extremely important. Um, one of the things that is difficult to do just with, uh, by releasing data and that, you know, by having a service, it's, uh, um, make, make it easier, it's like when you, when you want to have like several snapshots, like for instance, right? So that's one positive thing. So, so I guess 
what I'm saying is like it's a trade-off and in terms of, uh, so how much are we hindering and how important it is and how can we go beyond that? I guess it's the next thing we need to look into. Yes, mm -hmm. because, I mean, as, a, as an academic researcher, we, we, we are trying to work towards things that we can eventually transfer to industry. And if we're not able to, if, if, if we don't have the full suite available, Right, then which is agreed, and which is you know one of the things actually is that when you look at the way it works in uh, you know in uh, like like being and things like that, I mean you know data comes in <laughs> daily, right? I mean so it's not like looking at the snapshot for a year and then we come back, and so how uh, of course it's not the depth of research that you know that you're doing, and which is exactly where we need more innovation there, right? So, um, and, and I'll throw in one thing from my time at NSF where I like to joke that I used to only eat sausage, now I know how it's made. There was, in, in terms of the computing in the cloud, there was a, someone had a spreadsheet that could tell us if we had two snapshots of the web, how many fewer nodes on the computing cluster could we actually pay for? I mean, so there was some real money involved in being able to make this resource available. Mm -hmm. And people were counting the beans, you know, so there were bean counters there. And it, so the real constraints in making this available, and it's not that there's ogres, it's that, you know, trying to figure out a sustainable financial model for doing this is also right. a struggle. Mm -hmm. Okay, we Well, thank you very much. Are you still on, or? Okay, okay, I think I'm going to get the mic. <laughs> Let me introduce you, sorry. Oh, great. Right. <laughs> thank you very much. All right, so now it's my pleasure, actually. So now I'm going in my chairing role, and it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Haim Persh. So I was looking at uh, how many universities you've been to, and I thought maybe it would be easier to mention the ones you have not been to. But uh, so in the US, I will mention, so you, uh, you spent some time at Carnegie Mellon, MIT, uh, Stanford, where you did your PhD, then you've been the chair of uh, Rogers, Rutgers, Rutgers, I'm doing the French accent here, uh, computer science department, and also, uh, like for four years, uh, you served as the director of uh, the Division of Information and Intelligence Systems at the National Science Foundation, that's, uh, and that's how we made, uh, actually, the Web and Run possible there, so thank you very much, and uh, to you now. And thank you. And right now, I'm actually finally, after finishing up uh, four years at NSF, I'm on a sabbatical, so I'm spending it um, actually having doing scholarly stuff rather than being a bureaucrat like I was as department chair before that. And, um, and I headed the those of you who are from the U.S. I headed the division of information and intelligence systems, which funds a lot of the work in data technologies, amongst other things, at 150 million dollars a year or so. Um, but um, so to, to make this stuff grounded, let me give you an example of, of a piece of work that excites me. I'm going to give you lots of examples of work. Um, so people here may know about um, uh, Photosynth and a range of, product, a range of systems that have been developed by people at um, University of Washington and Microsoft. Download a bunch of images of, say, Notre Dame um, or some other place of interest. Is there some way to take a gazillion um, user-provided images and generate an actual model? Um, of what's being seen and make it uh, available to people as a way to navigate the images in a more effective way. And sure enough, a, a group of people at, at Microsoft and, and uh, UW have, have managed to figure out ways to do that uh, over a series of papers over the last few years. Um, those of you who are from the US are probably familiar with this image by now. Um, there's a game show in the US called Jeopardy, um, been around for decades, um, and it has people Self clues like this was the last one from the match I'm about to mention. Uh, William Wilkinson's An Account of the Principalities of Whatever and Moldavia, Moldavia inspired this author's most famous novel, and you're supposed to know the answer to this. Um, and what was really amazing was in February, um, there were three days of a show that had um, two human contestants and a computer contestant playing this game, and the, the computer actually won. All three players were able to answer that obscure question. How many people here know the answer to this? So the two people who, uh, the two humans, um, the one not with a finger, um, both made uh, over $2 million, and they're the most successful contestants ever on Jeopardy. 
And the reason they were able to, to, the reason the computer was able to do things was to be able to answer questions was it essentially downloaded gazillions amounts of information, including all of Wikipedia, and figured out how to use that knowledge to be able to answer questions. Um, here's a, an, another piece of work um, out of Microsoft Research um, related to the work that, that Evelyn mentioned, but here in, um, um, instead of it being about Twitter tags, it's about URL word breaking. Um, and if you want to figure out how to take some small piece of text where technical standards are forcing you to concatenate things in awkward ways and pull them back out to words in order, for example, to be able to uh, do a better job of um, figuring out uh, what to respond with in a web query. Um, if you have lots and lots of data about what are URLs, what are things that people have been querying, et cetera, you can actually do that particularly well. Same thing with spelling and a number of other tasks. Um, so what's making these things possible are, are um, uh, two technical drivers. Um, one of them is this is, if you go to Intel, um, uh, you can find an image um, of Moore's Law, Moore, one of the founders of Intel. The green part is a 1965 paper of his that first proposed that computing power would double over every 18 months, and then the actual reality here, which has been more like every two years. Um, and one of the interesting things about, um, about this, and you've all, you know, everyone knows Moore's Law, and you can do it different ways, by cost, by, in this case, transistors per die. Um, there's actually two lines here. The yellow one is about microprocessors, and the red one's about storage technology. And that's one of the things that's been really um, an important driver. Um, and it's not just about the fact that storage technology has kept pace with computing technology, but um, if you look at the pace of digital content generation, um, a paper, uh, to, uh, an organization called IDC came out with a study in 2007, then a follow-up in 2008. And in the 2007 one, they showed this graph that shows the blue line is digital content generation, and the orange line is um, digital storage on this planet. And according to their analysis, this planet sometime in March 2007 started producing more digital content than there's actually storage on this planet. And you can go to the paper to see more about what they mean by digital content, because that partly defines this. But the important thing here is did data generation is exponential. And in exponentials, it is the base of the exponent that wins. And so what we're seeing is not just that we have Moore's Law making computing power amazing. Um, we have data making it possible to do all sorts of amazing things, but outpacing even our ability to keep up with it. So data dominates computing, no matter how amazing it is that the power of my cell phone outpaces a machine from only a few years ago. Um, data outstrips even that. So, the data is so large compared, I, I don't mention anything here about computer networks, but if you focus on computer networks alone, moving um, a petabyte file from say here to Boston, um, I want to use Express Mail because that has higher bandwidth than actually trying to do it over the net, over a network. So um, you can't move data easily. And the world where you do data research by downloading the data onto your website and doing a thousand SVDs to set the first parameter on a calculation of a support vector machine for blah, 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 um, is unrealistic. When we start getting into the ki kinds of data that leading edge researchers in data intensive science are facing, and ultimately, which will become routine, um, given the fact that the base of the exponent for data production outstrips everything, whether or not Moore's Law keeps up, if Moore's Law doesn't keep up, we're in even bigger trouble. Um, but you can't compute it on it locally. You're gonna keep finding tasks where if you assume that it's your computing that has to run it, you're gonna limit the sorts of things that you can do. The same way that if you assume you have to have access to all the data. So, um, you know, these kinds of forces are not, um, are not new. They've been around for over a decade. It's led to um, what's being called cloud computing. You hear people kind of wave their hands about cloud, about cloud computing. Um, you know, it, for many people, cloud computing is ill-defined. I think it's just that it's being used to, mention, to refer to a juxtaposition of a few things. Um, here are three. Um, one of them is that um, it's sort of cloud data in the sense that data is available everywhere. So you no longer need to worry about, well, is it on my machine, is it on my cell phone? Um, it's in the cloud now, I don't need to worry about it. Um, cloud computing is also about the fact that if I can't move the data, I put the data somewhere and I move the computing to it. Um, and then finally, um, if I want to be able to support computing tasks they can't be managed within a single enterprise or organization. Um, you need to be able to have the computing sit somewhere that people can access it most easily. And there's a range of 
ideas for how to provide utility computing in the same sense that um, electric, electricity and water are utilities. How do you provide computing in a way that allows you to suddenly turn on all the lights in your house and you're, you, still, you just get charged more? Well, let's say you're running some sort of a website and suddenly it gets blogged on a, a prominent blog um, and suddenly you start getting a lot of people going to your website. How do you provide utility computing in a way that can support that? Um, what's kind of exciting is these are our um, technological drivers that um, Moore's Law and data production have forced cloud computing on us, and it's required a number of innovations. It wasn't just that someone said, okay, let's part, start putting more um, computers together into commodity clusters. Um, we invented new programming language models that made it easier to do these data intensive tasks. Um, we started focusing a lot more on energy efficiency, on uh, maintainability of machines, so the probability that a hard drive will crash on any machine is small, but if you have three million of them, it's happening nonstop. How do you address that? Um, in addition to the technological drivers, though, what I want to focus on um, today, in no small part, is the societal forces that are also constraining a lot of what we do, and it was related to my, my comment to an earlier question. Um, so. Data has a lot of baggage associated with it. I, my background is machine learning and data mining, and I've never had, I've been kind of a hired gun on a bunch of different projects um, to do machine learning and data mining. I've never had a collaboration where there wasn't some baggage associated with data. And so the question is, how do we provide support for data intensive science where there's always baggage? So for example, um, you might have issues like, I have massive amounts of medical records. I would love to be able to uh, support some form of digital epidemiology to discover all sorts of really cool things. But you know what, if I'm a hospital, I'm not giving my data to anyone because God, I'm gonna get sued about the, you know, releasing some uh, um, sensitive information about someone's health. Um, or um, I'm Microsoft or Google and I put in enormous resources to build a web crawler, download a copy of the web, and now everyone wants a copy of my web crawler. But you know what? Yeah, if I'm an academic, maybe I may not be too much of a threat, but it's an important business asset, and you want to, don't want to just open the doors to anyone because it's not just academics that might now have the keys to the castle. And these are just two examples. Um, so the implications for this is if we're trying to think about how do we provide generalized support for data-intensive science, um, we require approaches that allow access to data in ways that sustain the owner's control of the data. So you can say what data they get, whether it's the, core, the original data, derived properties of the data, um, what are the w ways that people can access them. And also importantly, um, the AOL data release showed how important it is to be able to retract data. So um, in the case of AOL, the data was pulled back from AOL, but there's copies of it all over the internet. Um, and so we like mechanisms that allow an organization to feel they have that level of control over the data. A second force at play is the, a world of data um, means a world of empirical methods. Um, you try to explore different variants of your um, web search algorithm. So um, you channel off a, a, a small stream of queries and you explore your baseline search engine with uh, a variant of the search engine. Or you do some sort of targeted advertising um, um, on, in some sort of uh, AdWords context or whatever it is. Um, Data forces the use of empirical methods. Empirical methods um, imposes a certain set of sensibilities that you need to be able to support with the data. In particular, um, generally experimental methodology is about reproducibility. Now, I'm a scientist. When I conduct science, it's kind of a no-brainer. I want to be able to publish a result that other people can build up. Well, first off, that they can believe that my results are right, and secondly, can build off of. Um, so are, they, are the results correct? Can we build off of them? But any context where you're using massive data and you're exploring different options and making business decisions, you want to be really confident that the business decision is correct. And so you need to understand the sensitivities. You need to be able to support uh, basic empirical methods. So the second implication of this societal driver, um, basically the implication of empirical methods being done um, soundly, is we require approaches that allow us to be confident in conclusions derived from data. And the third societal force um, that I'm going to focus on um, is, um, so this is an example of a paper uh, when the SARS epidemic was happening, people wanted to understand um, the uh, movement of people through the airlines. And you know what, getting the fact that, that I flew here on one airline on one time and another, you can't get that data easily. What you can get are the um, airline flight schedules, but it doesn't tell you that the person who flew from this leg 
this place here to this place here, and then went from this place to this place. It just gives you the network of airlines, but not what routes people are taking within it. So um, uh, some people published a paper where they used a resource called Where's George, an American resource where you could type in um, the serial number of a dollar bill and see where it's been. Well, you type it in, you say where you are, and other people have done the same, and you can actually track where the money that you've been has been. And if one day it's in Boston and the next day is in Paris, presumably someone carried it between those two locations. And so they used what was kind of a, a fun, non-scientific thing, but it generated an amazing resource to be able to say something about human travel. Um, this is a, one of my favorite examples um, of data intensive science. Um, so some people analyzed Google um, Earth data of pastures, and pastures that had cattle, and what they were able to do is they were able to determine that there was uh, um, 308 pastures, 8,510 um, cows, that cattle generally align themselves um, with the magnetic uh, poles in a north-south direction. Uh, despite mankind's reliance on cattle for millennia, no one had ever discovered this before, and it was only because they were able to analyze um, pastures on Google Earth. Um, here's another example is, um, so this was a paper that shows that species that can mimic sounds like parrots, and apparently some species of elephants, um, are also able to keep rhythm to music. And it turns out they used a number of different methods, but one of them was doing, um, using data from YouTube of dancing animals. Okay, so why, what I'm these are in intended to be somewhat whimsical examples that data will be used in ways never foreseen by those responsible for generating the data. And that was in some sense what the earlier question was about as well, is if you provide the data on some internet resource in a constrained way, you're constraining the ways people can use it. So the third implication of all this is we require approaches that allow flexible access to data in non-preordained ways. In the same ways that relational databases allowed ad hoc queries, we kind of want ad hoc analytics. So there are two examples where people have tried to achieve those three implications. Um, the first is the um, uh, Microsoft Engra Web Engram service, um, which I, I won't actually spend much time on since Evelyn's already described it. But the idea, though, is that instead of giving you a copy of the internet or of their web crawl, um, they give you a search engine or a query engine to be able to access statistics from which you can then do your science. So um, it um, allows access to data in ways that sustains their control. They can shut down any time they want. They're limiting what are the things you can actually get from it. Um, it allows us to be confident in conclusions derived from data because you can keep going back to it and running different experiments. Um, and also, um, it's not done with, in a preordained way. I mean, it still constrains things to some extent, but people are finding more and more ways to use that to do really cool things that no one had thought of in originally providing the data. For, such as, for example, this paper and the, the work that Evelyn was describing. Um, another example is um, Google's um, prediction API. So instead of providing a web service that you access to get the data and compute whatever, say, machine learning algorithms you want on it, um, Google knows machine learning. And so what they're, what they're proposing doing, and this is a, kind of a... Um, not even a beta release, but you have to kind of ask to be allowed to even try this. Um, but basically, give them your data, and they'll run their machine learning algorithms, and then you take it out and do your analytics with the outcomes. And I don't know of anyone who's actually published any results using this yet, but it's another model. Instead of you owning the analytics, if there's some baseline analytics you want to use, and they're on a web service like this, what you're doing is you're using machine learning algorithms as a service rather than data access as a service. Okay, so, so you know, I like both of them because they're addressing real constraints on what data owners have to confront, the baggage side of things, um, all the baggage they constrain. These are two ways of approaching it. But it's actually providing um, something better than signing an agreement with a data provider that um, there's another prominent company where they want you to say that you will destroy all copies of the data five years after receiving it. It's not clear what it means when you're getting petabytes of data to then destroy them. So um, you get really weird kinds of approaches for trying to deal with it. These are two that I think are particularly credible. But let me actually focus the rest of my uh, presentation on what's been driving my own research um, recently, and that's societal force number four. And if you look at many, it's not an accident, the examples I chose. Um, so the phototourism example, and there's a bunch of examples in computational photography 
that start with um, community supplied user content of images in this case. This succeeded because of Wikipedia, user generated content. This succeeded because of, again, user generated content. Um, seeing what people are typing in their search queries, what URLs they're using, et cetera. Um, this is, how many people know about Google flu trends? This was a paper that got published uh, less than two years ago. Um, Google has a pretty good idea of the geolocation of your IP address when you type a query. And so on a geographic basis, it actually has a pretty good idea of the distribution of query terms that they see. Um, so what happens if you start looking for the frequency of words related to flu? If you see a spike in those words, you might conjecture that maybe there's a flu outbreak there. And what this paper shows, it's uh, joint with Google and the Centers for Disease Control, which is the primary organization in the US for tracking flu outbreaks, traditionally done by gathering data from pharmacies and a week later actually figuring out where the outbreaks are. They were able to detect flu outbreaks one to two weeks earlier than the Centers for Disease Control, if you will, the state of the art. And if you go to google.org or you search for Google flu trends, you can go to a website and they have a map of the world and um, with their statements, with Google flu trends saying where there's flu outbreaks right now and the severity of it. Um, another example that I like, Galaxy Zoo is a website. Right now, um, we're generating more astronomical data than any human will ever be able to see and much less the um, you know, highly trained astronomers and so on. Um, and so what Galaxy do, Zoo does is it presents you images and it asks you to do some sort of simple image understanding task. There's a little initial train up phase and you get to do um, some simple analysis of galaxies and images. Um, there's some other work, um, uh, NASA click workers did something where you had to circle craters on Mars and, and things like this. And by the way, circle craters on Mars was really cool. If a lot of people circle where there's a crater on an image, the average of their circle is a pretty good idea of where the crater really lies. This paper here is really cool because um, what they were able to do is they had over 40,000 people label galaxies, and by um, doing an analysis of, the, of uh, tens of thousands of galaxies, they were able to determine that galaxies spin differently depending on the density of galaxies in that region. And the only reason they were able to do that was the, the knowledge workers saying, doing analyses of these images. So it's a scientific result that wouldn't have happened if humans hadn't stepped into the scene. Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, you can actually pay people a penny a shot, a nickel a shot, to say, take an image and generate a caption, or translate text, or, any, or give you feedback on um, which picture looks better on this web page. Um, and you know, you, you pay five cents a shot for someone to do that, and you give it to 200 people, you get a pretty good idea if one image is, is liked by more people than another. Not as easy to do solid scientific investigation of it, but it is now possible to do humans as a commodity to do things that we don't know how to, do compu don't know how to get computers to do, and right now it's not clear that they're, how you generate a sustainable label, labor market to do things like generate captions on images. Um, I could go on on it. This is a really cool new force in, um, in the worldwide economy. So people are increasingly inseparable from data. There are obviously tasks which it's not really centrally about people, sensor networks generating lots of data, et cetera. Um, if it's a human-centered task, there's um, people involved in those too. But an enormous number of the cases where we're talking about data-intensive science, people are involved. They're either generating the data, they're annotating the data, they're correcting the data. Um, and the, the Microsoft efforts, um, semantic um, computing. Semantics is about the connection to the real world as perceived by people. So humans are the, the, when we move to semantic computing, it's again about people. And what's particularly sensitive here is people are unreliable, fallible, unpredictable, differently motivated. They might be paid to put false reviews on, um, in Amazon, for example. I could go on and on about the different ways that um, people have been subverted and manipulated uh, to do all sorts of really um, things that don't match the motives of the people who created the systems that involve those people. Um, but so the, the fourth implication, which I don't think is as strongly addressed by um, the Ngram server or the prediction API, is we need to harness both data and people in increasingly coupled and integrated ways. And so the things that I've been focusing on, the title of the talk is web-based data services for research. And 
I realized after it was too late to change the title, as I was putting my slides together, that this isn't perfectly accurate. It, I think an effective way to be thinking about this is it's web-based knowledge services for research, where the data is a knowledge source and people are a knowledge source. And what are general ways to harness these knowledge sources, these knowledge resources, into services the same way that we're now approaching you know, routine web services and now data services? So um, people are increasingly thinking about this as a computer scientist, figuring out how do I think about this in computational ways. So for example, Greg Little and others at MIT, um, the people that I'm interacting with in part during my sabbatical, have a, a, essentially a programming language, the same way that MapReduce is good for massive data tasks. This is a programming, task, a programming language for specifying tasks where you get a person to do something, you get a second person to edit it, a third person to say which is better, and you do this iteratively as a way to deal with the reliability of people. If computer science is about building reliable systems out of unreliable components, this is a way of doing so with people. Uh, CrowdForge takes the MapReduce approach um, very loosely and takes it to things like Wikipedia. How do I take a task, divide it up into pieces, and then reassemble it? Um, and they show that you can actually use their programming language for doing this. Um, Crowdflow, where you're using both machine learning and people to do things. So if the output of machine learning is a classifier that um, tells you yes or no, this thing is a bad loan risk or not. Um, if the output of the machine learning system is something that has low confidence, you can go off and get people to answer it as well. And other things like that. And so this is a programming language for people in machine learning, resolving machine learned results and people that are also in the loop. And Mechanical Turk itself, the way you access it is through an API. You can write programs that drive, as a matter of fact, you typically write a program that drives Amazon Mechanical Turk. So we're still populating the space of ideas in this notion of people as a knowledge service. Um, you know, how do we allow software to manipulate knowledge services, um, data or human? The thing that, that we're seeing is people are coming up with approaches to doing this that assume some circumscribed context. We don't have the, the C or Java for people. Um, but for a more narrow context, we're seeing programming languages that are, um, that are showing sustainability across a, a more constrained set of tasks. Um, my own personal interest coming from machine learning and data mining um, is how can, if we break down the wall of machine learning where humans label things and then throw it over the wall to the machine learning people instead of machine learning, instead of people be part of the machine learning equation, um, how does that change what we do in machine learning? And how do we, in particular, get reliable results in the same way we've been able to in machine learning when humans are now part of our problem rather than someone else's. And I've been calling this human-centered machine learning. Um, and I could go into this in great depth, but I wanted to sort of, in the short time I had, go into the, the bigger picture. Um, so, you know, it's humans that often generate the dependent variable, say the label on objects in some classification task. Um, and we always assumed in machine learning that people are expensive. Now, um, what do we, how do we use people when they're cheap? I've already alluded to some approaches where to get reliability you can ask someone to label something, ask someone else to maybe revise it and have a third person say which is better, things like this. And at MIT, I've been working with um, a faculty member there, Cynthia Rudin, um, and a postdoc, Shade Eric and, um, on thinking about different ways that you can um, utilize a pool of labelers when it's too costly to get everyone to label everything. So, you know, every time I go to someone on Mechanical Turk to label something, I can either take something new and get them to label it, or I can take an existing thing that maybe there's a lot of disagreement about and get another person to label it to get more confidence in that particular item. One of those is going to be better than the other at different points in time. Can we be more thoughtful about the right ways to do this? Also be more thoughtful about, of all the people I could go to, who are the better ones to go to for this particular item? So to wrap up, I think I'm just right at the time. Um, so um, the title of the talk was web-based data services for research. Um, you should think of this actually as web-based knowledge services for research. I think that's a constructive way to be thinking about how do we bring together industry, academics, government, um, to provide a way to do data-intensive science in scholarly ways, um, and just data-intensive um, enterprises more generally um, is thinking about things as web-based knowledge services. I, as a computer scientist, think that another way, that probably the, the cooler title of my talk would have been Programming the Data-Intensive Social Computer. How do we approach this as computer scientists so that we can solve questions um, that are data intensive in, in sort of the clean ways and reliable ways that we as computer scientists approach questions, when, and social in particular, because people are involved in the question. And what I'll do is I'll stop here. 
with an image from Moore's original paper, um, which had this, this graph where he extrapolated from five points, um, the little green part of the early curve. Um, so in 1965, um, between notions and cosmetics, you could also buy um, handy home computers. And uh, so apparently Gordon Moore was not the person who came up with the idea. Apparently some um, cartoonist for IEEE or for whichever organization put this together was trying to be in, in his face being funny, like, yeah, right, like people are going to be buying co computers as consumer commodities. So if anything comes out of the Moore paper, it's not just Moore's law, but also just how unsuspecting um, people were 50 years ago, this is where we'd be today. Thank you. Thank you. So my timer says I have time for... And I was on kind of a little warp speed there, so uh, my apologies. Feel free to. How do you handle the very high unreliability that you get from the Mechanical Turks? I mean, we did some initial experiments, and then people just ran through in three seconds through a survey of 10 questions. And then some do just like always click on the left, some do click irregularly. And uh, sometimes we want to find out that our task is too hard and that we would observe irregularity. But of course, you, it's very hard to find the distinction between the true irregularity coming from our question being imprecise and irregularity coming from people who just want to earn the quick nickel or whatever you, you pay them. Right. No, great question. I'm, people are getting wiser about it, but certainly um, the first couple of years of, mechanic, of papers that rely on Mechanical Turk invariably have the structure, here's the here's idea, we're going to use Mechanical Turk to do this, we did this, the results were lousy because people were unreliable, and here's a way that I came up with to make it more reliable. Um, basically, the API, um, every task has a URL that you control and you actually get to specify a task. Um, the, so the reliability of mechanical Turk workers, they're there to make money. If you come up with a URL that you click through on and ask them a bunch of yes, no questions, there are people there who will write bots that just randomly click the links and you don't get real answers from that. So what do you do with the fact that the, the Turkers do have certain unreliabilities? So people, either you plant gold standard data that you know the answers to, and if they're missing a lot of those, you know it's probably not a human looking at it. Um, you get others to look at it, have voting on top of the results. Um, you, um, so, so basically there's a, a set of four or five ways um, that people are, so there's a set of best practices that are evolving. One of the papers that I, I, I hope I'll be able to write soon, I wanted to do a meta-analysis of the papers that are using these kind of crowdsourcing um, tools because everyone's kind of reinventing the same ideas. Another one is you pl when I say gold standard, if it's an image analysis task, what you can do is you can, say, plant a bunch of, of stars on it. And whatever task you're going to have them do, also have them say how many stars are in it or whatever image you, want, you do. And the point is you give them another task to do that takes almost as much time as the original task, and so it doesn't really lower your click-through rate, but it means that the only people who are doing this are people that are going to spend the time you want to get the quality of answers. So there's some best practices that are being developed, but it's still ad hoc. Um, so, but uh, a great question. Yeah, uh, I'm fascinated by your vision because I think uh, the things that you point to are exactly the things that have made a big impact in, in my own machine learning group. Um, so, for example, not just the data services, but also using human computation in the form of Mechanical Turk is something that's just inevitably ended up as part of uh, our, our research. And I think uh, uh, the idea of using humans as parts of computer programs uh, is kind of a very interesting vision, but I think uh, you know, we, we're going to have to rely on more and more unreliable components, including humans, for the sorts of things humans are good at. The difficulty is we, you know, humans are only good at certain things, right? So we have to be very careful in, in deciding what to farm off to humans and what to get the computers to do, right? So um, do you see, do you really see this as a sort of vision of uh, computation in the future where you're going to farm off things, to, some things to humans and some things uh, to computers as part of a single sort of program and is that like, is the new programming languages direction the way to go at that or more ad hoc ways? So I, I think, uh, so first off, I think 
you're getting a computer scientist talking about this. I actually think it's an intersection of computer science and behavioral science that needs to come together. So how do you get reliability out of people is also a behavioral science question. Like, for example, how much do you pay them? The results actually show that if you overpay people, you get them less interested in the task. Um, and so um, bringing behavioral scientists into this is important. But as a computer scientist, yeah, I do think um, coming up with general approaches like programming languages for this are important. I think the reason we're seeing success on it right now is because of economic disparities around the world. Um, but I think that it's not just about economic disparities. There are going to be tasks where I could do it, but if I give it to someone else, maybe it's more menial, say, than, you know, it's someone who's going to be um, making a reservation for, at a restaurant for me for Thursday night. Um, and I could do that, but if, it was, if there was a tool for me to be able to do that easily and get someone else to, to deal with it, um, I'm going to pay that person less than I would make with the same amount of time that I'd free up. And so I think there's actually an economics that um, everyone has things that they do they'd rather pay someone else to do and free up the time. And you know, we each have different skills, and wherever those skills are, we want to free them up to do that, and there's other people. So, so I think there's an economic argument to be made for why this is sustainable, not just because of it. You know, let, let's hope that one day the, everyone is equally um, uh, blessed with wealth and health and so on. But even in that day, I think we'll still be seeing this. Um, there were other elements to your question, but um, and I'm, ha I'm happy to talk afterwards. Unfortunately, I have to have like a, a, another trip scheduled. Anyway, so I'm going to be here till about lunch. So I, I love talking about this stuff. So if you have any questions or whatever, please hit me up. Otherwise, send me an email. Um, let me just quickly, whoops. I thought I had, yeah, my email's down at the bottom of that. Okay, thank you so All much. All right, yeah, that's. Thank you again, and, uh, and it looks like we have the title for your next talk, right? Yes, yes, actually, <laughs> or at least my next proposal. <laughs> so is this a, a Right, so now are we going to switch? It's my pleasure now to introduce Serge Sharov from the University of Leeds, just uh, across the channel. And uh, you have, uh, you've been working also in the, uh, as an entrepreneur uh, okay, in the past, looks right. like. Well, I mean, you admitted <laughs> to it here, so. Uh, and, uh, and otherwise, I mean, so your background is in both mathematics and linguistics. And, um, and you are very, very interested in data, too, and gathering data, aren't you? That's right, yes. <laughs> okay, I'll let you go. Thank you. Right. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks, Evelyn, for, for inviting me here. And uh, the difference uh, in my talk is that I'm going to talk multilinguality. I'm going to talk about the languages on the web because I'm from translation studies and I'm mostly interested uh, in differences uh, between languages and in, uh, uh, in what you can get from the web to help a human uh, uh, humans to, to understand other languages or to, to translate, right? And the first thing uh, is about the applications because we talked about the importance of data and uh, Evelyn mentioned several ways of working with data, but uh, I would like to start with, uh, with the applications. And one simple example uh, is dealing with terminology. New terms appear all the time and in the monolingual context, uh, uh, if, What's the way of spelling multi-touch? What is the most common way uh, of, uh, of doing this? And in the multilingual context, how to translate multi-touch technology into Chinese, for example, right? Because the traditional dictionaries, they are not, uh, uh, they, uh, they simply don't cover terms of this sort. And then with the new phone we got from, from Microsoft, there is this item, People Hub. And when you translate People Hub into Russian, for example, then you can't use the word people at all, because whatever is reasonable translation for people is, and whatever reasonable translation for hub is, they simply don't match. And then you need to find some other solutions, and this is the kind of data you can get from the web to find a suitable solution for, uh, for a novel problem, right? And then the second uh, uh, task is machine translation, and we all know this, so that Google uh, is reasonably good, and also other machine translation agents are 
quite good. And so nowadays it is uh, much less likely that uh, this famous phrase, uh, uh, I want to buy some cigarettes, will be translated into my hovercraft is full of eels. So and the reason is because we have more data and we can mine this data from the web and we can find translations. Uh, yet another way uh, of using web data is uh, for language teaching purposes because uh, with uh, knowledge about uh, fr frequencies of words and grammatical constructions, uh, we know what is important for the learner and also for the learner in a particular field. Because uh, if we want to, uh, to train our students to write academic papers, for example, then we need to, uh, to, to teach them words which are more common in academic papers. And then uh, the, uh, the same applies also to learning uh, about idiosyncrasies uh, of a particular uh, okay of a particular language in this case uh, that's uh, that's that's about English so in English we can say a book is on something or it is about something but in the case of Warren there is only one way possible and then it is again quite easy to to mine from the web and this applies to to any language because any language is full of idiosyncrasies of this sort right uh, then yet another application uh, is information retrieval and one particular thing, so information retrieval normally works without knowing about uh, each, uh, each uh, individual language, but there are bits in information retrieval when you need to have some knowledge uh, ab about language, and one example is genre search. If you go to Google, you, there are already some uh, experiments with what we can be referred to as genres. So, so you can search separately for news or blogs or for academic articles. The problem in this case is that Google cheats in this. Uh, because uh, if you search for, uh, for Google, uh, under news, then you are not searching for news. Uh, you are searching for items Google pre-classified as news so that uh, if something is published in the New York Times, then it is news, even if it is a book review. Right, and at the same time, if uh, there is a news outlet which is not registered with Google, then it is not news by, by default. But then, uh, in addition to this, uh, you, uh, there are also other types of things you would like to find on the web, and they are not available at the moment. And this is, uh, this is why uh, some kind of genre classification uh, is, uh, is needed. And then, not only in information retrieval, uh, uh, in, other, uh, in other areas, quite often you need to know about what genre this particular text is. And one example uh, is a classification of words according to their parts of speech. For, for many applications, we need to know uh, in, particular con in a particular context, this word like book, uh, is it a noun or a verb to buy a book and to book a flight? They, uh, they do have diff diff different meanings and identification of, uh, of the part of speech is uh, is called part of speech tagging or part of speech identification. And uh, it's not a big surprise that, uh, that the accuracy of this procedure relies quite crucially on, uh, on the genres. So in some well-behaved genres, we can achieve the accuracy of 98%, and this accuracy drops. So, so the error rate increases uh, sevenfold when you go from, for example, news to uh, forums on the web. Right, and there are all, also some other applications in which uh, you need to know about genres. Right, and then how do you uh, work with, uh, with linguistic data? This is normally done by using text resources and uh, very much in line with, the, uh, with the, uh, Moore's law uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of te 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 text collections, uh, there was uh, an exponential rise in the amount of data available. And this is probably the very first te text collection available from 1961, and this was a collection of one million words. Right, and uh, to put this into perspective, in plain text file, that's about six, seven megabytes, right? So that was, for 1961, this was a huge collection which probably occupied more than a fridge of data. And, okay, so uh, 30 years later, uh, another land, uh, mm, uh, an, another landmark corpus is the British National Corpus, which was 100 times bigger. And again, for that time, it was a huge amount of data that was, uh, Okay, six, seven hundred uh, megabytes and uh, in more genres. And in that sense, it was a great resource, but there is, okay, we now uh, work with the web and we have uh, trillions of words in all languages. We have more genres and this is all great, right? And what's the point of this rush 
to get more data inter, uh, in the case of linguistics. And uh, these are a couple of examples. So if we take a word, and this word is moderately frequent, right, integrity, a, a fairly common word in English, and we have 10 examples of it in the Brown Corpus. Uh, we have a bit more examples uh, in the BNC, and then uh, in UQAC, that's a corpus collected from the web, we have uh, many more examples. But again, the point is not to collect more examples, but the point is that there are constructions, and the frequency of constructions, such as undermining one's uh, integrity, uh, is, uh, a, is extremely sparse, and you can't find them uh, quite easily in, uh, in a small corpus. And even in the BNC, the frequencies are not statistically significant. So you need some, something on a bigger scale. Right, and then the second problem is that the BNC uh, is a corpus from the 90, uh, actually it was collected in the beginning of the 1990s, but uh, it was based on, on text from the 1970s and 1980s. And then, okay, one simple example is the browser. Uh, you can imagine that in text from the 1980s, how many uh, uh, internet browsers were, and okay, there is no such, such a construction as configuring a browser at all, right? So that's our, and yet another problem is that small corpora such as the BNC, they are not reliable. Uh, if you take uh, words like gastric and pylorus and mucosa, they do belong to the top 6,000 words of the BNC, and uh, this defines the very core of the language. Any intermediate learner of a language knows all the words in the, uh, in, in the, in the top 6,000, 6, and okay, right, that's, that's, that's highly unlikely that they do belong to the core of the English language, and the reason is quite simple, because part of, uh, of, of the collection of technical texts for the BNC, it was based on the Journal of Gastro Enterology and hepatology, and yes, so 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 you get gastric and mucosa uh, in the list, right? And so that's uh, these are all the reasons for, for using the web, and uh, it's easy to, to use the web. You just type a query in uh, in Yahoo or in Google and or in Bing, and then uh, the title of my talk came. Uh, uh, so it refers to the concept, which uh, which is now okay to to the word, which is uh, quite popular now, that's Googleology, right? And Googleology is the science of making queries to Google in order to get some interesting linguistic results. And you can get some interesting linguistic results. The problem is that they are not uh, uh, that reliable. And actually, I think that one of the, the first study the first study I know of, which used Google for such tasks, was a, a study done by Pete Turney, and he tried to, uh, uh, to find synonyms. And he used AltaVista. At that time, AltaVista had the near operator. So he was uh, lo looking for examples of livid and uh, in the context uh, in which imposed was somewhere nearby. And then if you make another query with livid and uh, a word like collapsed nearby, uh, then you can find by the number of hits, you can estimate whether livid or, impo or uh, sorry, uh, whether imposed or collapsed they are, uh, which of them is the closest synonym to, to Levitt, and then uh, this gives you a fairly reliable answer in this case. Uh, another example uh, is finding collocates, two words uh, occurring together. If you don't have enough information in the corpus, then just make a query and you get it. Then you can even apply que uh, Google queries to, uh, uh, to uh, syntactic analysis, because uh, when we have a construction and then we need to analyze it, female bus driver uh, is analyzed in a way different from, from the school bus driver, and the way of estimating this is by making queries. You make uh, uh, queries uh, to find female drivers and female buses, and most likely you will find more female drivers, and this gives you an idea about uh, syntactic analysis of, of this sentence. And for school bus driver, the, the situation uh, is just the opposite. And then uh, there is also an example in using uh, anaphora, that is, uh, we have a pronoun, he or she, and then we want to find the person this pronoun refers to, and if uh, in our dictionary we don't have uh, information about a person, in this case Haim, then we can find, uh, we can, we can find uh, the, just, 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 we can estimate the, uh, uh, the gender of the reference by, by making queries. And again, it is, uh, it is surprisingly, uh, su surprisingly accurate uh, in this case. And this is the context of work which is going under what is, uh, what is called the Special Interest Group on Web as Corpus of ACL, and the, uh, it involves a Googleology. It involves searching Google and making queries. The problem is that, 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 uh, that what you get from Google 
or from Bing, but, but, but Googleology normally uh, uh, uses Google, and uh, this is based on the number of hits and not on the number of actual, uh, of actual occurrences of a word. And the second thing is that these hits are not reliable. They change from time to time and they depend on some outputs from the uh, uh, on, uh, from ranking algorithms used by Google and from estimations used by Google. So you can't work with this. So yet another way of, of approximating this is by making lots of queries and downloading lots of URLs, either by doing direct crawling or it is easier to do this by using a, a large number of queries. Like, and then if you take uh, some general words, such as conditions clearly ground much, you will get a general corpus and this is what I did for a range of languages, and uh, they have been all used uh, in, uh, in applications, uh, in, uh, in machine translation and terminology mining and language learning in our group. But then if you want to collect a domain-specific corpus, such as an, a, a, a corpus of manuals for ID, you just fire uh, probably in this case not thousands but hundreds of queries of this sort and then you, you will get a range of pages and this will be the basis for your, for your corpus and uh, then if you want to do this in a multilingual context then just translate your seed words and then uh, you will get in the end a fairly reliable collection in Spanish, German, uh, Russian and Chinese which, is, which corresponds quite closely to uh, your original, uh, uh, to, uh, to what you, uh, you can find in English, right? There are two problems, and one problem, one actually common misconception, I think, about the web is that it contains porn and spam, right? So, and then it's an interesting research question, how much porn and spam do we have in our collections, right? And this, the second question uh, is about genres, as I mentioned, okay, porn and spam removed, uh, do we have any fiction on the web, and how much uh, of the web space is uh, uh, consumed by fiction in comparison to news, for example. And this is, again, something we can, uh, we can answer if we, uh, if we use uh, the right tools, right? And so that's, that's about understanding the web. So we, we collected our trillions of words from the web. What uh, do we know? Okay, and these are some examples of what, uh, of what we did. And one thing is, uh, this is an unsupervised approach to, uh, to classifying the domain and it is based on an unsupervised approach to selecting the keywords. So we take, uh, we, we take a random web page. This web page, okay, it, it came from Leeds, but the reason it is here is because uh, it was uh, in, uh, in the Ukwa crawl. And, uh, and for this web page, we can quite easily generate a range of keywords. Some of them are very specific to this page because the author of this page uh, made uh, quite a few references to his own works, and that's, uh, 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 that's why uh, his uh, name uh, is, uh, okay, has the highest log likelihood score in, uh, in this list, but most of the other words, they are also, uh, they are reasonable keywords. And if you, uh, uh, you do a little bit of keyword pruning, because otherwise you have too many keywords to, dis to, to describe the web page, and also they are not, 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 not only too much, but also they are not helpful, right? What you can do after that, you can do some, some clustering. Uh, there is yet another problem which is uh, not solved is to determine the number of clusters. In the experiments below, I assume that we have 20 clusters. That's the magic number because it is easier to compare. You have one collection and another collection and then you compare the frequencies of the two collections and existing methods I know of for uh, measuring uh, uh, the accuracy of unsupervised clustering in the absence of the gold standard. They are not really reliable. Right, uh, uh, there are two approaches to clustering. Uh, you can you, you either use hard clustering, this document belongs to this cluster or to this cluster, or you can use soft clustering, and this is based on probabilistic topic models. So uh, this is an example. Normally a document belongs to a topic, and at the same time it covers some other topics. And this is uh, like uh, document D1. It is mostly about topic zero, but it is partly about some other topics. And then document D2 uh, is very much about one topic. And then we have uh, uh, document D4, which is somewhat in between a range of topics. Right, so, uh, so once uh, we apply this to, uh, uh, to the web, or at least to the approximation of the web, we can get from our crawl, we can get the results. So what do we have uh, in, uh, in the case of the BNC and uh, in comparison to what we get in the case of uh, a web crawl? And uh, so 
how do we do this? Again, for, for the BNC, it could be easier because uh, all texts in the BNC uh, have been annotated. Uh, in the case of UQUAC, uh, we can mostly rely on the, on the keyword. So each cluster is considered to be a, okay, a, a document, a, a collection in its own, and then we can select the keywords and then we can interpret the keywords coming from this particular cluster. And what is interesting is uh, that uh, we have uh, one cluster which, uh, which is based on text about computing. We have uh, medical texts uh, in, in the BNC, as you know, but we also uh, have quite a substantial cluster of computing in the BNC, and the reason was that the BNC was created in, uh, uh, in the computer science department uh, at the Lancaster University in collaboration with the, with the Oxford University and the Oxford <laughs> University Press. And yes, uh, they have a large number of texts about computing. The web is about computing. Okay, at least computer scientists, they're quite uh, um, prominent on the web. And because of this, uh, we have even two clusters for computing. And it's interesting to compare the keywords. So in the case of the BNC, okay, these are the keywords from the 1980s. For, uh, for computing, and then we have uh, references to Unix, to IBM, uh, surprisingly Microsoft is there, and uh, as well as Sun. Uh, in the case of, uh, of a web collection, we have two types uh, of computer clusters. One is mostly about the algorithms and technology, right? And uh, so the, this, this comes from real computer scientists and, uh, and, and uh, programmers. And the second cluster is, so to say, the user cluster. So uh, it is about the web, it is about searching, it is about web websites, browsing, uh, HTML, etc. Right. So, so this is what you can get out of out, out of comparing two large collections uh, in one language. You can also do the same for multiple languages and for specific domains. And I can run quite quickly through this. So let's uh, let's imagine that uh, uh, that we collected a corpus uh, in wind energy for Russian and for English, and we would like to compare uh, the topics. And these are some some of the examples of topics we can get uh, for this uh, uh, for. For this corpus, so what we can do in order to compare them across languages, we can translate the keywords from Russian, in this case, into English. In some cases, we have the ambiguities. So the Russian word astance, for example, can be translated into, uh, in two ways, as a train station or as a power plant. And then, uh, in this case, we will get a multiplication of our features. And then we can get an intersection of features between, uh, uh, between the translated Russian part and the English part, and then we can find which portions of the corpus in one language correspond to which corp portions of the corpus in another language. Right, so that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's about domains. Uh, genres uh, is an interesting topic as well, and the problem is that we don't know which genres are there, and uh, the uh, existing corpora, they disagree on the collections of genres, and uh, to give you one example, in the brown corpus, uh, the first example I, I gave, uh, uh, we have 15 genres, nine genres of nonfiction, and six genres of fiction. In the BNC, we have 70 genres, 69 genres of nonfiction, and only one genre of fiction. And if you think that six genres of fiction out of 15 is an overkill in the Brown corpus, then you can take a look at the list of genres in the British Library. So this is how the British Library classifies a text, and this is only the beginning of the list, because they have more than 200 labels in order to classify fiction in, uh, into genres. And then uh, there was another study by Karna Damczyk. She did it for German, and uh, she arrived at an inventory of 4,500 genres, and then they didn't cover all the genres which uh, which British Library treated as important uh, for for fiction. And then, in practically any any application, we can also find some uh, uh, texts. Uh, so some some classifications for Amazon classifies books. Uh, into genres. The problem is that this doesn't cover the entire web, right? The collection uh, of genres are uh, in, uh, in Amazon. It doesn't cover the entire web. So what uh, uh, we arrived at as a kind of classification, uh, a functional classification in terms of, uh, of the aims of text production, uh, which can be applied to any text on the web uh, so that uh, we, can, uh, we can get, for, for each and every text, we can get a more or less reliable estimate of the genre of this text. I will, um, um, uh, I will explain uh, the uh, list of links at, uh, sorry, the, uh, the list of uh, 
uh, genres at, uh, in the example I'm, I'm about to give, but then once you have the categories, what is also important, in addition to, to the categories, it is important to know the features. How do you classify uh, uh, the texts? And in this case, it is quite surprising that a very strange feature, uh, which is a character engram, and they apparently are much more successful in classifying web pages in comparison to other types of features we tried, such as, and the obvious features are words and part of speech engrams, and also HTML tags. And then it is, it, is, it, is, it is strange because this is a very low level feature, but at the same time, it makes generalizations which are much better than, uh, than other uh, features which, which work on the higher level. One example is uh, in the case of reporting, so they, these are mostly new, uh, news wires, then dates are important and, uh, and this is captured in engrams and in academic uh, texts. Uh, Okay, on the one hand, uh, the adverbs, uh, they are much more frequent, and this is captured by the endings in the case of English. Uh, then there are also passive constructions, and this is captured by, uh, by the use of by, and there are also various occasional constructions, such as aims, claims, seems, problems, systems, to that, and they are all generalized into, into one single feature, which, uh, which is one of the most uh, prominent uh, uh, in this case, and this, uh, so, so, and we have a, a, a small demo on how to, to, uh, to classify practically any, uh, any text on the web into, uh, into uh, some kind of reasonable set of genres, right? But the, uh, the point I was, I, I was making at the beginning is that we need to understand the web. We need to understand how much porn and spam is there and also how much fiction is there. So fiction in, uh, in the case of this generalized uh, uh, classification scheme uh, is uh, classified as recreation, so texts uh, are aimed at uh, uh, recreational reading, and then we can, we can see that, that in comparison to the B and C, there is a uh, quite con considerable drop in, uh, in the frequency of fiction on the web, so we knew that, but then this is an estimate of how much uh, fiction is there on the web. So the difference between IN and UQUAG, these are two different crawls and two different ways of estimating uh, the content of the web, and so there are differences uh, in the methods involved, and obviously there are quite considerable differences in, in the number of news wires, for example, and uh, the number of, uh, the, uh, okay, uh, sm small differences uh, in, uh, in the amount of advertising, for example. Right, so this is something you can get quite easily from, uh, uh, from the web in large numbers. And so this is, this is just, uh, just a summary. So what we get from the web, we can, we can get trillions of words in many languages. And we can use some services, and we can also use direct results of crawling uh, in order to, to work with this. And the greatest disadvantage uh, for the time being of the web and gram service is that it doesn't work with the languages I'm interested in. So it doesn't work with Chinese, uh, Arabic, and Russian, for, for, for example. And this is, this, is, this is the most important thing, uh, is to compare. Uh, the distribution of, uh, of, uh, of words and texts on the web across languages, right? But we can still mine uh, uh, texts from the web and we can use them successfully in order to match uh, 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 texts and topics uh, across, uh, across languages. And these are just, just this shameless plug uh, for the examples of, the, uh, of what we, we managed to collect from the web, right? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for the deep dive in natural languages here. Any question? I have a question. When you talk about like how much spam is on the web, mm. what do you mean by spam here? How do you characterize it? Okay, one example uh, is uh, is here. So then, then this is this is this is a question. There are actually two definitions of spam. One uh, corresponds to uh, to search engine spam. And these are texts uh, which uh, are not aimed at human readers, but they are aimed at uh, uh, search engine robots collecting texts, and then they obviously pollute. So, so on the one hand, they pollute their indices, but they also pollute our crawls. And so that's the, there is a point in identifying them 
and, and uh, essentially re removing them. So, so this sort of spam, okay, it, it's interesting to know how much spam of this sort is there, but then, but then that's, uh, we, we would like to get rid of it and we are, okay, you are successful in removing such, uh, uh, such link farms from your Bing indices and we are also reasonably successful in our task. But then the second type of spam uh, is uh, advertising. And in that sense, it is sometimes it is, uh, it is connected with link farms, but, but, but most of the time these are genuine web pages trying to sell, to promote uh, services. And uh, they do this some, sometimes in, a, in subtle ways, sometimes uh, using just shameless claims. And what, uh, what you can see here in, uh, in this case, there are uh, some adverts uh, in, uh, in the BNC, but not that many. What you can get much more, uh, uh, you, can, you can get much more on the web and you can estimate. Okay, uh, the counts are, so uh, according to, uh, uh, to our studies, the counts, uh, uh, the accuracy of the counts is around uh, 80%, so then these figures can be taken uh, with, the, with, the, with the 80% accuracy. So you can estimate, depending on the method you collect text from the web, uh, you can get 11 or 15% uh, of, uh, of fairly shameless advertising. And okay, so that's, that's uh, something you can, uh, okay. Okay. You, you can live with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Yeah, on, on your comment about, you know, it would be great to have Yangrams for Russian and uh, Chinese, Chinese and, and Arabic. Uh, yeah. I agree. <laughs> right. It's a question of resources and, uh, you know, it takes time and effort to put all that together. So the more people ask for it, maybe mm -hmm. we'll be able to do it. Right. Well, so let's thank our speaker again. And now it's time for the lunch break. Thank you. Right.